everyone! How are you feeling today? I hope you are all in good health. I am Saiful Asra binti Rozali. I am a teacher at SMK Raja Abdullah, Kuala Lumpur. You will be with me today to learn and discuss a very interesting topic, ecosystem. By the end of today's lesson, you will be able to 1. Explain with examples of producer, consumer, and decomposer. 2. Interpret the food chain and the food web. 3. Describe the roles of organisms in a nutrient cycle in the ecosystem. And 4. Explain the interdependence and interaction among organisms and between organisms and the environment. So, are you excited to learn all that I have just mentioned? Let us start now, shall we? Why are there various living things around us? Do they play any important role in the environment? What happens when a species or an organism is extinct or keeps decreasing in number? And what can we do to maintain a balanced ecosystem? I hope you still remember what the food chain and the food web are. Both the food chain and the food web show the food relationship between organisms in a habitat. The food web is a combination of more than one food chain. Let's look at a simple food chain on the screen. A head of cabbage is eaten by a caterpillar. The caterpillar is then eaten by a sparrow, which is then eaten by a snake. The snake gets energy from the bird. The bird gets energy from the caterpillar. The caterpillar gains energy from the cabbage. Hmm, but where does the energy in the cabbage come from? Can anyone tell me? Great! You are right. The energy comes from the sun. The cabbage is a producer. Green plants are producers as they are able to make their own food by converting the light energy from the sun into chemical energy through a process called... That's right! Photosynthesis! And you have learned about this important process in Form 1. Remember? If plants are called producers, then how about the animals? Good! Animals are the eaters, so they are called consumers. Hmm, now, this is not so difficult to remember, right? The first consumer feeds on plants. They are normally herbivores or omnivores. They are also known as the primary consumers. Examples of primary consumers are caterpillars, grasshoppers, cows, and chickens. Animals that eat the primary consumers are called secondary consumers. They are also known as primary carnivores. For example, a frog is a primary carnivore because it eats primary consumers such as flies and grasshoppers. A secondary consumer can also be an omnivore. For example, the sparrows that eat fruits and caterpillars. The third consumer in a food chain is called the tertiary consumer. Tertiary consumers are secondary carnivores that eat the secondary consumers. They are usually bigger in size compared to the primary or secondary consumers. Examples of tertiary consumers are snakes, foxes, and eagles. So boys and girls, we can conclude 
that energy is transferred from one organism to another organism. Energy is transferred from the sun to the producer, then to the primary consumer, followed by the secondary consumer, and finally the tertiary consumer. However, not all of the energy from the organism is transferred when the organism is eaten. This is because some of the energy is used by the organism to carry out its life processes such as respiration, excretion and movement. When living things die, they will be broken down into simpler materials through a process called decomposition. And this task is carried out by bacteria and fungi which are known as decomposers. The interaction by which the decomposers feed on dead organisms is called saprophytism. So pupils, do you understand the first part of our lesson? Shall we try to answer some questions? Look at the food chain shown on the screen. Based on the food chain, can you name the producer? Good! The producer is the grass. Now, can you identify the primary consumer? Well done! It's the grasshopper. Why? Good! It is because the grasshopper eats the grass which makes it the first eater. For the next question, can you name the secondary carnivore? Is it a sparrow? Are you sure? Or is it the snake? Good job, pupils! A secondary carnivore is an animal that eats the secondary consumer. In this food chain, the secondary consumer is the sparrow and the sparrow is eaten by the snake. Therefore, the correct secondary carnivore is the snake. So do you see the difference between a secondary consumer and a secondary carnivore now? Good! Boys and girls, in an ecosystem, the transfer of nutrients and energy takes place continuously. This means that every nutrient and energy obtained is used and returned to the environment to be used again. This cycle is called a nutrient cycle. Water, oxygen and carbon dioxide are used by living things. Water, Oxygen and carbon dioxide are then returned to the environment by different living things through various processes. Can you tell the roles of animals, plants and microorganisms in maintaining a nutrient cycle? Examples of nutrient cycles are water cycle, carbon cycle and oxygen cycle. Living things play a very important role in these nutrient cycles. In the water cycle, plants return the water that is absorbed by the roots back into the environment in the form of water vapor through transpiration. Plants are also important in covering the ground. This helps to retain water content in the ground and to prevent the soil from becoming dry. Meanwhile, in the carbon cycle and oxygen cycle, living things carry out respiration which consumes oxygen and releases carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. At the same time, plants take in carbon dioxide to carry out photosynthesis which will then return oxygen into the atmosphere. Now we can see how important living things are in maintaining the balance of the natural cycles. Now, let us go to the next slide. What is a habitat, pupils?
good. A habitat is a natural surrounding or home of an organism. A few examples of habitats would be the freshwater pond, the desert, the paddy field, the vegetable farm, and the ocean. An old palm plantation is also a habitat. Can you tell me why? Good! This is because the old palm plantation is a home of many organisms. Here, in the plantation, the organisms can get all the necessities in order for them to survive. There are various groups of organisms that have similar characteristics and can reproduce to breed offsprings. The first level of biological organization is known as species or an organism. You are an organism too! Examples of species or organisms found in an old palm plantation are the owl, the mouse, the snake, and the old palm tree, of course. The next level of organization is the population. A population is a group of organisms of the same species living in the same habitat. Examples of populations in an old palm plantation can be a population of all palm trees and a population of owls. There can also be a population of mice and also a population of snakes in the same plantation. Many populations in the same area come together to form a community. In a community, populations interact. For example, a population of owls interacts with a population of mice. The owls hunt and kill the mice for food in order to survive. When all of the living and the non-living components in the community are put together, they will form an ecosystem. Pupils, can you try to name some examples of living and non-living components in the oil palm plantation? Let's see. Examples of non-living components that are present in this plantation are the soil, which gives a place for the trees to grow, sunlight, which provides energy to the plants, and air, which is necessary for sustaining lives. Other important non-living components are water and nutrients. So, boys and girls, now we can say that an old palm plantation makes an ecosystem. Now, let us take a look at the desert. A desert can be another example of an ecosystem. A population of scorpions, birds, Reptiles and other living things are the desert community. When these community interact mutually with one another, including the non-living components, a desert ecosystem is formed. To summarize, we can say that populations are all members of one species. Communities are made up of many populations and ecosystem includes communities and non-living components. Before we discuss further, let me test your understanding on the biological organization. Are you ready? Look at the screen. Can you rearrange the levels of biological organization in the correct order? starting with the smallest entity to the largest entity. Let us look at the answer now, shall we? The correct order is species followed by population, community and ecosystem. Now pupils, in an ecosystem, the organisms live and interact with other organisms as
as well as the environment. In other words, all living things depend on each other and on the environment in which they live. Let's think of this habitat, a tropical rainforest. In this ecosystem, the tiger hunts and eats the deer. Various types of plants in the forest compete with one another to obtain enough sunlight, space, water, and nutrients. At the same time, we can see certain plants growing on other plants. There are also animals that live inside some of the trees. All these organisms live together in harmony without any external interference, creating a balanced ecosystem. Let us study the various kinds of interactions that exist between these organisms. There are three main types of interactions between organisms which are competition, prey predator, and symbiosis. Boys and girls, organisms living in the same habitat may face a limited supply of basic needs. In such a situation, the organisms might need to compete for the limited food, limited space, nutrients, as well as mating partners. This interaction, which is caused by a limited supply of necessities, is called competition. Competition may happen among organisms of the same species or between organisms of different species. More intense competition will happen when the number of organisms is higher than the supply of necessities or when the limited necessities become lesser. In the prey-predator relationship, the predator hunts and eats the prey which means that the prey is eaten by the predator. For example, bears are the predators that eat salmon. So, the salmon is the prey. Can you name a few predators and prey other than bears and the salmon? Good! Lions and tigers are predators that eat goats, deer, and zebras. So goats, deer, and zebras are prey. Well done, pupils! Lizards and frogs are predators too. They are predators for insects like flies, grasshoppers, and mosquitoes. When a mosquito bites us, we are providing food to the mosquito. We lose our blood to the mosquito, right? However, that does not make the mosquito our predator and we as its prey. This is because we do not die when a mosquito bites us. This is another type of interaction. What is this interaction called then? Mosquitoes suck our blood to survive. They also spread diseases like malaria and dengue fever. Such organisms are called parasites because they benefit from harming us. We are the host for these organisms as they feed on us. This relationship between a parasite and its host is called parasitism. Parasites such as lice, and bedbugs are examples of parasites found outside the organism's body. Tapeworms and roundworms are parasites that are found inside the organism's body. Parasites get food from their host in order to survive and at the same time cause harm to their host. So remember, in parasitism interaction, it is a win-lose interaction. On the other hand, there is another type of interaction that brings advantage to both organisms. For example, look at those birds. They continuously follow the water buffalo. These birds are the cattle egret. It is quite common to find birds following cows, 
buffaloes and zebras for food. But how? Birds follow the grazing animals and eat the bugs or flies that tend to bother them. Sometimes, they also eat parasites like lice and bugs on the animal's body. In this way, the birds get their food from these animals while the cows, buffaloes and zebras are able to get rid of the parasites on their body. Isn't that wonderful? Pupils, this win-win interaction is called mutualism. In this interaction, both organisms benefit from each other. In some other interactions, one organism gains benefits from its host without harming or bothering the host. For example, a squirrel that lives in a tree trunk. The squirrel makes the tree trunk its habitat. It does not cause any harm to the trees and at the same time, it does not bring any benefits to the trees either. This kind of interaction is called commensalism. The tree is the host while the squirrel is the commensal. This is similar to a bird's nest fern that grows on a taller tree to reach sunlight. The fern is the commensal that makes use of the tree without affecting the tree at all. Boys and girls, parasitism, mutualism and commensalism are the different types of symbiotic interaction. Please remember that different organisms have different interactions with each other. Some eat others, some harm and feed on others, some live on others, and some help each other. Interaction among organisms can be beneficial to us. For example, natural predators, Parasites or pathogens can be used to reduce the number of pests in an area. This method is called biological control. Biological control does not use any chemicals and is said to be an environmentally friendly method. It normally involves prey predator and parasitism interactions. The population of mice in an oil palm plantation can be reduced by keeping owls without harming other organisms in the plantation. The breeding of mosquitoes in a pond can be reduced by having guppies that will eat the mosquito larvae. Can you give other examples? You may discuss this with your friends and teacher at school. Now. Let us complete another activity. Identify whether the following are the advantages or disadvantages of biological control. If you understand what I have explained earlier, you should be able to answer them all correctly. Are you ready? So pupils, did you get all the answers correct? Well done! The population size in an ecosystem may change due to certain factors. Diseases, presence of predators, source of food and change of weather will cause population size in an ecosystem to change. These changes will then affect the state of the whole ecosystem. Our ecosystem is really important. If we keep harming and polluting our ecosystem, we would soon go extinct and the earth wouldn't be a good place to live in anymore. Well, boys and girls, it looks like our lesson has come to an end. I hope that today's lesson will help you to understand the main concepts of an ecosystem. I hope you enjoyed today's lesson. Goodbye!